Keat when it plays at one of a number of her classic films coming back to cinemas across the country from November the 24th. It's been another bumpy week for the government. When isn't it? But Michael Gove, the Environment Secretary, has won some plaudits from the Green Lobby for his determination to save the bumblebee. We'll come on to that later on. There's just a few other things we should discuss first. I'm tempted to call you Swampy Gove. It's an extraordinary <laughs> change for you. How do you feel being kind of fated by the, um, the left Green Lobby? Well, I, I think that one of the things in politics is that you, you can't always know who's going to react well or badly to what you announce or what you decide. You've just got to look at the evidence, make your mind up, decide in your heart what you believe is right, and then take the consequences. Um, and sometimes what I've argued for in education has inspired some pretty negative reactions. Some of it inspired some positive reaction, but you've just okay. got to believe that uh, if you follow the evidence and do the right thing, then ultimately the judge will be, is the country in a better position? Well, let's talk about doing the right thing in relation to one of the most important stories today, which is Miss Zahari Radcliffe. Yes. Um, in a terrible condition in, in Iranian prison. What was she doing when she went to Iran? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, one of the things I, I, I want to stress is that you don't um, know. Uh, there is no reason why uh, Nazneen Zahari Radcliffe should be in prison in Iran, so far as any of us know. No evidence has been produced which suggests that she should be detained. We know that the Iranian regime is capable of abusing the human rights of its own citizens. It appears here to be harming the human rights of someone who, uh, whose plight necessarily moves us all. But you say that you don't know what she was doing. Her husband is very clear that she was there on holiday with her child. Uh, well, in that case, I take exactly uh, her husband's uh, uh, assurance in that regard. So was she training journalists? Well, her husband said that she was there on holiday, and her husband is the person who should know. Her family are the people who should be in our thoughts at this time. But one of the things I just want to stress about the line of questioning, which I know that you want to go down, is that there is an effort somehow to shift attention and direction away from who is really at fault here. And it is the Iranian regime they're the people who jailed Nazanin. They're the people upon whom our focus should light. And there is no reason, and no excuse, and no justification for her detention, and she should be released. And therefore, it's very, very important for our top diplomat, the representative of this country, the Foreign Secretary, to choose his words very carefully when it comes to this regime. Do you not think that it is time for Boris Johnson to formally change what he said? He's apologised for the effect of it. He hasn't changed what he said. Well, I, th I think that uh, there's nothing the Iranian regime would like more than for the attention to be shifted off them and onto us. And I think we but make a big mistake, Andrew, if we think that the right thing to do is to blame politicians in a democracy who are trying to do the right thing well, for the plight of a woman who has been imprisoned by a regime that is a serial okay. abuser of human rights. Who's in the dock here? Iran. It should be the actions of with, their judiciary respect, and the revolutionary good, guards. With respect, that is not good enough. The Iranian judiciary are using Boris Johnson's words to take her back to, uh, to, to court and suggest that she will face another five years because of what Boris Johnson said. He is part of this story. If the Iranian judiciary want to use the words of a Democrat in order to justify an unjustifiable decision, then it is our responsibility to call them out. Let's not play their game. Let's but not those allow... words weren't right, were they? He said that he thought she was training journalists, and that has been grabbed on by extremist members of the Iranian judiciary to put her plight into an even worse position. That is his fault, surely. Whatever we as Democrats do or say, extremists will choose to deploy for their own purposes. And we play their game. If we point the finger at Democrats who are trying to do the right thing when it's extremists who are responsible for the abuse of human rights. And so, we should be firm and resolute in making it clear as a country, across all political parties, that it's the Iranians who are responsible, you, in particular the Iranian do, judiciary and the revolutionary guard. Do you think Joris, Boris Johnson chose his words carefully? I think that you uh, and others and all of us have a responsibility to think carefully about who's really at fault here, and that is the Iranian regime. We, well, you can agree that they're at fault, but we can also agree there is a problem here. Let me remind you what you said about Boris Johnson last year when you were sitting in that chair. I enjoyed working with Boris during the referendum campaign. I think he has great talents and great abilities. But you need something else to be Prime Minister. You need to have that grip, that executive authority, that sense of purpose, that clarity. I had hoped that Boris would show that, but in the end it wasn't there. Grip, 
authority clarity. Still very, very important if you're Foreign Secretary. Can you really say that Boris Johnson has shown those things? Yes, I think Boris is doing a great job as Foreign Secretary. I also think that uh, the attempt to uh, shift the blame away from Iran and onto a democratic well, elected position. I'm not trying position. to shift the blame away no, from No, no, I know you're not, Andrew. But, uh, and you're fairly reflecting uh, uh, currents of opinion uh, here mm. in Westminster and elsewhere. But I think that uh, it's plain wrong for us to try to find fault with Democrats when the real responsibility is to say to the Iranian regime, you are a serial abuser of human rights. You're the mm. principal state sponsor of terrorism. You have blood on your hands in Syria. Your responsibility is to ensure that this mm. British citizen is at liberty. We play their game. We play into the extremists' hands if we do anything other than show solidarity in the face of their abuse of human rights. It's part of democracy when we point out democratic mistakes, I would argue. Sure. Can I suggest that Boris Johnson, if he can't be sacked for this, is now a completely unsackable figure in this government. Well, uh, the thing about um, uh, every member of the government is that we are all there because the Prime Minister believes that we should be doing a particular job. No one is unsackable. We are all there in order to do our job. And I think Boris is doing a good job as Foreign Secretary. And I think, critically, the uh, 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 countries that wish our citizens, at the very least, no good. Um, are countries that we should all stand sure. up to collectively together. You've made up with him, haven't you? Well, I tried to get on with... <laughs> no, but you, <laughs> I mean, you, you went for him, you know, quite publicly and quite famously, and we had quite an exchange about that way we back. We certainly did. We certainly did. And now you're allies again. There's a memo repeated in the Mail on Sunday today where the two of you write to Theresa May, and in that memo you say, we are profoundly worried that in some parts of government mm. the current preparations are not proceeding with anything like sufficient energy. Can you explain exactly what you're worried about? Well, I'll say two things. The first thing is I'm not going to go into the detail of what may or may not have been said in private correspondence. I write letters... I've helpfully just read it out. <laughs> you, you, well, you haven't actually seen the original letter, so I'm not going to get into what is or is no. not in mm. that letter, because the business of government, as you know, would grind to a halt if uh, okay. everything in every letter well, that I that sent to were then discussed on this show. Let's put that to one side and just Thank ask you. about the sentiment. Are you worried about the state of preparation for Brexit and possibly for no deal? Well, uh, as a departmental minister, I have a responsibility, perhaps a bigger responsibility than, than almost any other domestic minister, to make mm. sure that we are ready for any eventuality. And... Um, I'm not worried, but I am determined to ensure that in my own department, which is the, the area mm. for which I have responsibility, that we have everything prepared. in place for every eventuality. Now, what I want, what I believe uh, the country wants, certainly what the Prime Minister and the Cabinet want, is to secure a good Brexit deal. And that's what we're working towards. We're doing everything we can to secure that deal, but we're also making sure that whatever may happen in these negotiations, mm -hmm. that Britain can make the best of them. You'll have caught a little bit, I hope, of James Dyson talking yeah. there, a very inspiring figure in many ways. He says we should just walk away now. I can understand James's point of view, but I, on this occasion, respectfully disagree with him. I think it is far better for us to be engaged in those negotiations. My Cabinet colleague, David Davis, I think is doing a very good job in making sure that Britain's interests, and indeed the wider interests of mm -hmm. Europe, are respected within this process. And in this process, there is an expectation at the moment that Theresa May is going to have to go a little bit further when it comes to the money in order to open the trade deal talks properly. Would you block her if she tried to do that? I certainly would not. I think that... Um, so we have to spend a bit more well, money. Well, no, I wouldn't block the Prime Minister in doing what she believed was right. Um, we have to make sure that in, when we're negotiating on money or on anything else, that we both respect Britain's interests, but also ensure, as the Prime Minister has said, that no EU country is out of pocket as a result of the decisions that we've made. And the Prime Minister, in her speech in Florence, I think, spelt that out very effectively. And my view well, is the Prime Minister and David Davis should be given the flexibility they need in order to secure that good deal. Now, you know that in this programme we love to go back and trawl through quotes and try and find embarrassing quotes and put them to people. Yes. I have tried really, really hard. I've gone all the way through the referendum campaign to look for the quotes from Michael Gove, which said, and by the way, we'll be paying £20 billion or £30 billion pounds just to get out of the thing. And I can't find those quotes. Well, I think... Because you didn't tell people, <laughs> did you? <laughs> well, during the course of the referendum campaign, I was interviewed on lots of shows, including, I think, this one. And one of the points that I made is that at the end of this process, we will have taken back control of our laws and, and of our monies. The critical thing about this negotiation is that we need to make sure that we pay a sum to cover our obligations. And then once we've paid that sum, as the Prime Minister has said, we won't be paying any membership fee for the EU anymore. So when Simon Stevens of the NHS says, we need our 350 million quid a week, 
Is he going to get it, and if so, when is he going to get it, do you think? Well, I think Simon Stevens made a good case for increased funding in the NHS, and um, I've always supported increasing funding in the NHS. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the sum mentioned, we've, we've discussed in the past... We don't even say another sum mentioned. £350 million. <laughs> that, is, that is the figure, the gross yeah. figure which the European Union controls yeah. um, uh, uh, every week. Now, uh, once we're out of the European Union, obviously we can then decide how we spend that money. Okay. And I think, uh, you know, as, well, as Jeremy Hunt said, I think, last week, um, I'd like to see a significant slice of that money once we've left go to the NHS, but ultimately it's for the Prime Minister and the Chancellor to decide. Let's come to your own department now. You have announced a new body to oversee environmental protection yes. after we leave the EU. In your article about it, you come quite close to suggesting there are some things the EU has done rather well. Yes, I, I, I think it's only fair to say that there are some things that have happened while we've been in the European Union mm. that have been good. So if one looks at the EU's record on the environment, there are, there are balancing items. So on the common agricultural policy and the common fisheries policy, I think they've got things wrong. But the European Commission and some of the directives which it's been responsible for enforcing have been good things. Now, some of those directives have been, have been authored by British politicians. So, for example, the Habitats Directive was actually the, the product of Boris Johnson's father, Stanley. And it's been a good thing, a British politician working internationally in order to achieve something which is worthwhile for the whole world. And so you're creating a new body. And again, some people who supported Brexit might be a bit surprised because they would think the point about Brexit is parliamentary sovereignty. Make Parliament in charge of everything. And already, even before we've left, you are creating a new bureaucracy outside Parliament. Why is it necessary? Well, I, th I think that it's a mistake to think that Parliament should do <laughs> everything. Uh, the whole point about democracy is that you have a balance of institutions. And in the article that I've written in the Sunday Telegraph, I've made the point that, as well as Parliament, and it will play an even more important role mm -hmm. once we've left, it's also the case that our judiciary will play an even more important role through judicial review. But that's not enough. We do need to go further. And we do need to recognise that there are institutions at arm's length from government properly independent that can play a role in making sure that uh, citizens get the justice they deserve and in particular the environment gets the protection it deserves. And you have said we will have better environmental protections after leaving the EU than we have now but is there not a countervailing force as Galbraith would have put it? Uh, Wilbur Ross the American Trade Secretary has suggested that we have to change our regulatory regime to get the best kind of deal that we now need with the US and that means lower standards in some areas not higher. No, we, we, I've been clear, my Liam Fox has been clear that while we do want a trade deal with the United States, we won't be lowering environmental or animal welfare standards. Free trade is a good thing, but free trade uh, founders on the rocks of public opinion. If people try to use it as a Trojan horse, if a Trojan horse can founder on rocks, if people try to use it as a Trojan horse for lowering environmental protection. So we're not going there. All right. Um, can I ask about the kind of practical effect of all of this? What changes in the British countryside do you want to see after we leave the EU? How will things look different? Will we have better hedgerows? Will we have more organic farming? What will happen to the woodlands and the forests? What is your picture of the British countryside after we leave? All of the above. What I'd like to see, firstly, is, is more trees. We have a, a determination as a government to ensure that over the course of the next few years that we plant uh, 11 million more trees in our country. We also want to see a, a growth in the sorts of uh, habitats that encourage um, a wider range of species. I want to see the, the number of farmland birds increase. I want to see species which have been on the verge of uh, extinction and certainly endangered return in healthy numbers. And I also want us to, to, um, to help support farmers to okay. produce food in a sustainable and productive way. Now, that speaking, doesn't mean that everyone has speaking, to go organic. Speaking of which, but, speaking of which, your colleague Christopher Grayling yes. said that if we left after no deal, one of the things we'd have to do is to grow some more food in this country. Presumably your department, because it's a well-prepared department, is planning for that. Well, uh, the, it, it's not the case that the department grows its own food, but it's certainly no, the case that British farmers are uh, the best in the world. They are uh, adaptable, ready to cope with uh, different scenarios. It's our job to help them. But the critical thing is that I I expect that British food, will actu victory. British food will actually be um, increasingly in demand worldwide because the trend okay. overall globally is towards greater quality and British food is in the best position, British farmers are in the best position to meet that demand okay. for the very highest quality. We're running out of time. Can I ask you about something Sadiq Khan said? He said yes. we need a new Clean Air Act in this country. You're in charge of the quality of our air and we need a new regime for diesel and petrol cars. Is that what you'd like to see from the budget? We need Clean Air Action. I won't get into the budget. It's very close. Uh, the Chancellor would chew my ear off if I tried to uh, speculate about what was going to be in it. But we've already announced 
steps to ensure, including bringing forward um, uh, 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 electric cars and getting rid of diesel cars on our roads by 2040. We've already announced steps. There will be more that we will announce. What we need you, is clean air action, not a clean air act. You've said not only diesel cars off our roads by 2040, but petrol cars yep. too. In fact, virtually everything we think of at the moment as a car is going to go when people are thinking about their next car should they now be thinking about buying electric well I'd like to encourage people to buy if they can electric or hybrid of course the whole do you, point do you drive an electric car I, I don't at the moment but I'm looking at a variety of them my wife who writes a well I won't go into what my wife writes about but uh, she uh, recently reviewed an electric car um, and uh, fantastic now I recognize what we need to do is to bring down the cost of electric cars they're not within everyone's budget the whole point of setting the legislative um, and the regulatory timetable that we have is to give people time to adjust. Michael Gove, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Now then